Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third of the webinar series for the FASTER project, which is installing 73 rapid chargers across the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland and the west coast of Scotland. Today, we're going to be looking at the future of Scotland's electric vehicle charging network. And we're also going to be having a look at its past and present as well. We've got a very technical group of uh, panellists here today. We've also got some very technical people in the audience, but don't worry. I'll try to make sure that everything's explained in simple terms as well. If you're not from a really sort of techie, nitty gritty background, we'll make sure that everyone is able to keep pace in this webinar today. So we're actually just waiting on the last of the panellists joining us. They're having technical difficulties signing into Zoom. But we have with us today Neil Swanson, who's the director of EVA Scotland, Electric Vehicle Association of Scotland. We have Bob Murphy, who is the network manager of ChargePlace Scotland. Uh, we have Stephen Trainer, who's head of contract operations at ChargePlace Scotland. Uh, we have Donald Monaghan from the Faster Project, who we'll come back to in just a second, and Matt Jackson, um, who is the, the low carbon transport lead, or net zero transport manager, I should say, sorry, at, um, at Scottish Futures Trust. Uh, we're also going to be joined probably halfway through Donald's uh, upcoming talk uh, by Jamie Dunsmore, who is the head of low carbon fleets and infrastructure within Transport Scotland, who of course is pivotal to Scotland's charging network. So hopefully his technical difficulties will be solved in just a minute. But I think first and foremost, it'd be good to see who we have with us today. So I'm just gonna launch a quick poll here. So what's your involvement with electric vehicles? What sort of people do we have with us today? Are you a local authority with charging infrastructure on the ChargePlace Scotland network? Are you just an EV driver, like at regular every day? Or do you, you know, are you a fleet manager of electric vehicles, for example? We've got quite a lot of answers pouring in already. Um, so yeah, we do have you know, a reasonable number of people who own charging infrastructure. So today's webinar is going to be very important for them because of the, the future direction that ChargePlace Scotland shall take. Uh, and that Transport Scotland is taking as well. That's obviously going to be pivotal. But actually, um, despite the very kind of techie nature of, of today's webinar, we do have a lot of people who are just regular everyday EV drivers. So I shall end that poll now so that we can we can crack on. But um, out of everyone who's uh, had a chance to answer so far, as you'll see, the majority of us here today are the end users of Scotland's charging infrastructure, just everyday EV drivers. But that said, we've got a decent number of uh, owners of charging infrastructure that we'll be discussing the network of today and also uh, charging infrastructure providers too. So interesting stuff. Thank you, everyone. I've just realized I forgot to hit <laughs> share results there. Now you can see it. There we go. Perfect. But what we'll do to kick everything off is Donald shall give us a quick update on the FASTER project uh, and where it's at today. Thank you, Ian. Um, just I'd like to say, I suppose, good morning to everybody um, that has uh, taken the time to join us this morning. And uh, obviously, I want to say a big thank you to our guest panelists, to Neil, Stephen, Bob, Matt and Jamie uh, for taking the time out of their busy schedules. Um, and I'm looking forward to, I suppose, what promises to be a very interesting discussion this morning. Um, and just a reminder, if you do have any questions uh, for the panelists, you can pop those into the into the question and answer box and uh, the chat functions also open for interactions throughout. Just, I suppose, in terms of a, an update from the FASTER project team, um, I know we have uh, some of you here today for the first time, so uh, just a very quick overview of the FASTER project itself. Um, as Ewan has said, um, we are an EU funded uh, project under the Interreg 5A programme to deliver 73 uh, rapid charging points across Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland over the next year to 18 months or thereabouts. Um, just this morning, uh, we've had, an ex uh, we've had an, a confirmation from our funders that the project has ex uh, secured an extension from May 2023 to October 2023. And that's just to help ensure that all key deliverables are met. So it's it's very welcome news for, for all the project partners this morning. Um, in terms of what's happening in Scotland, um, the public tender for the charge point infrastructure and the associated services closed back in May. And our project mm -hmm. colleagues at Hytrans are currently progressing with the tender assessment. And in tandem with this, they are finalizing the legal agreements with their partner councils. 
as well as community landowners. And we would expect further updates on, on this aspect of the project to be available over the next few weeks. Um, just over, over the past few weeks, uh, we've also been collaborating with uh, James and the team at Transport Research Partners on the development of a survey to assess transport patterns and motorist behaviours across the Interreg area. And this follows from a similar piece of work that was carried out at this time last year. Uh, the results from the survey will help us identify any changes in attitudes towards electric vehicle use and sustainable transport over the past year, and particularly as we move into a, a post-COVID era. Uh, the survey will help us identify what motorists and transport users deem to be the key benefits of using electric vehicles and what they consider to still be the biggest hurdles. Um, the survey will examine whether motorists have had the opportunity to test drive an electric vehicle over the past 12 months if they're not already an EV user and will determine their thoughts on the current charge point provision um, right across the Interreg area, so uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The survey itself will close on the 15th of July. Um, we had 1,500 respondents to that last year. So I would be very hopeful that we can uh, build on that um, this year. The survey link itself is now available on our website, which is fastereVcharge.com and the associates uh, social media sites. And the link will also be included in the follow-up email after this webinar. And again, I would ask if anyone um, that's attending today can help amplify the survey through sharing with colleagues, family or friends, or on any social media networks, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, because again, the, the bigger response that we get to the survey, uh, the better information that we have um, across the regions. And also, I suppose I'm very excited and uh, looking forward to uh, the release of our first, the first in our new series of uh, Faster Project films uh, featuring Ewan and Rick Boulamere. Um, so we filmed those back at the Arnold Clark Innovation Center in May. And the first of those, which focuses very much on the Honda E, which I think is one of Ewan's personal favorites, um, that will be released over the next uh, week or so. So if you keep an eye out on our social media channels for that. And again, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the film once it's released. And again, you're more than welcome to, to share that out. So I'd just like to say before we move along um, that we will be taking a short summer recess from the webinars um, for July, but we will be back again in August, on the 10th of August, and that session will explore electric vehicle ownership and uh, maintenance. And it promises to be a really exciting um, session and informative as well. So um, Ewan will probably give us a little bit more information about that towards the end of today's session. So uh, without further ado, I will hand back to Ewan and we'll get the discussion underway. Thank you, Donald. Um, poor Jamie from Transport Scotland. I've just had to invite him onto the webinar via another email address. So if you see Jamie Dunsmore sneaking in as an attendee, Donald, could you elevate him to a panellist, please? That'd be fab. Um, don't, don't, don't tell anyone, but it, he had caps locks on when he was trying to put in his password, and now he's locked oh, out. Oh, no. Happens <laughs> <laughs> us all. Happens us all. Yep, yeah, true, true. But um, well, whilst we're waiting on Jamie, um, that's the point, actually. I don't know how long Jamie's been driving EVs, but there's certainly a few veteran panel. And the first question that I have for everyone is, Charge Play Scotland, of course, is, is effectively a sort of one card, one app fits all network for the, the bulk of Scotland's charging infrastructure. It's kind of unified in a way. But there was a time before Charge Place Scotland um, when the, the first crop of modern electric vehicles has started to hit the market in the early 2010s. So having had a chat with some of the panellists um, who were who were there back in the day, I've, I've been driving them since 2009. Um, but Bob, you were Edinburgh College's fleet manager uh, in it was 2011 that you, you, you first started to, to look into EVs, wasn't it? So what was it like before Charge Place Scotland? What did people do? So there was a, a scheme called Plugged In Places, which kicked off around about sort of 2010. And that was the, the original initiative to put chargers across Scotland. And um, at the time, Charge by Scotland didn't exist. So any chargers that were installed were on the, the Charge Your Car, the CYC network. 
Um, but it was very, very early days, of course. Nobody was really sure how things worked, how it all went together. Uh, and there was a, a very, very limited amount of public charge points uh, on the network. Um, so long distance journeys were a bit of a challenge if you were wanting to do a kind of long distance journey, if you're mad enough to try and attempt it in something like an IMEV around about that kind of time, um, which is exactly what I did um, <laughs> because we had to find out these kind of things. So it was a very steep learning curve to, to kind of get to grips with everything there. Um, EVA Scotland, of course, in its early days, there was a kind of small cohort of drivers that were uh, kind of pioneering sort of things and stretching limits uh, to find out where things could, uh, where you could go to, where you could drive to, um, and then taking electric vehicles to kind of some far off places and things. And, uh, you know, one of the very, very first trips I ever went on that, that, that really sort of stretched the capabilities of the vehicles we had at the time was to try and Aberdeen for a conference. Uh, and of course, in the, the pre charge place Scotland days, uh, we had to get cards, uh, had to get a CYC card, but didn't know we had to get a CYC card uh, until I got to Broxton and found out that I couldn't activate the charge point. Um, so yeah, very, very steep learning curve from that kind of point of view. Um, but since then, the network's grown um, exponentially almost uh, over that kind of period of time uh, to now be a, a very sort of integrated and very sort of far-reaching network that allows you to go anywhere in Scotland without you know, worrying too much about being able to find a charger when you get there. Absolutely. So back then it was RFID only. There was no app then for, for Yeah, chargers. largely, yeah. Yeah, largely RFID only. Um, I mean, when Edinburgh College started putting <laughs> fleet vehicles in, we had to build our own chargers. There weren't even any chargers you could buy. Um, off the shelf and install on the ground. So we had students build and create our own ones. Uh, and then when we got chargers installed as part of plugged in places, um, they were on the CYC network, but we didn't get the CYC card. You had to apply for those separately, but didn't find that out until we were already on the road drive to Aberdeen with them. Um, so yeah, it's, it, was, it, was, it was fun times. It was interesting. Yeah, true, true. And um, just to, to almost kind of trump you on the, the EV stakes, Neil, you were saying that your work was, was using EVs back in the, the 80s and so on, but that was... Yeah, we, we had a, a brief foray with uh, some rather vintage Bedford CFs back in the 80s. That wasn't what you'd call a huge success. Uh, and again, they were lead acid. There was no charging infrastructure. They weren't even three pin plug capable. They actually needed a charger so it was returned to base. Uh, they worked on short journeys, but the range at that point was about 40 miles. Uh, then later on in the 90s, we had a, a foray into uh, the, the van versions that came from Peugeot at the same time as your 205. Uh, for anyone who's not yet seen Ewan's 205, it's up in the museum in Dundee, uh, worth a look. And they got a bit more use, had a bit more range. They could charge off a, a three-pin plug, but there was no infrastructure to go further. So that was around 98, 99. Uh, and then things just moved on once we came to the, the introduction of plugged in places uh, and we've all seen the change since and it makes a huge difference. True, true. Um, well, actually, the, the 106 rather than the 205. Sure. The, that's all right. No, but the Peugeot 106 electric, fun fact, was responsible for the first on street public charge point in the UK, which I think yeah. would have been a three pin. Um, but oh, yeah, wow. I mean, it, it was it was only kind of the late 2000s that type one, type two, Chadamo, that sort of, you know, the, the, the charging formats that we are seeing on cars today, admittedly type one and Chadamo are now being phased out, but, you know, you can still use the cable that comes with your car to plug into a type two charge point. You know, they have that standard, well, that standardization has allowed the public charging network to, to grow as much as it has. So I think that, yeah, Bob, your foray into EVs in the early 2010s was really the beginning of the modern charging network. Uh, and we saw the likes of Ecotricity. They started off putting three pin charge points in motorway service stations, then quickly replaced them with rapid chargers. And that was all your RFID kind of Tesco club card-esque, you know, tappy card thing. But um, they then moved to an app, which was horrible. Anyway, but um, in terms of uh, looking at what was happening in, in Scotland, versus what was happening in, in England. Obviously, the various different local authorities in England were all going for different networks as all of these networks were, were springing up. So you needed a different app, a different card, a, a different everything, basically, didn't you, depending on where in the country you were going. Um, so I suppose that that was the, the inspiration for the creation of Charge Play Scotland, one would, would argue, wouldn't it? 
in, yeah, in, the absence so, yeah. of, in the absence of Jamie, we'll let Bob. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, this is it. It's it's one of these things that I think the the people at the time who were in charge of everything did, did have a, a very very strong vision as to to how it should be or what the best practice should be at the time. And it's one of these things that makes perfect sense. If you've got a large regional area, you might as well have something that's cohesive. Uh, and it's worked out very well in that kind of sense. Uh, as we can see down you know, below um, under the border, it is a bit bitty and it is a bit fragmented. Um, although, you know, contactless is a great level of, of all these kind of things as, as time goes on and so on and so forth. But, but yeah, I think Charles Play Scotland set a, a very, very good template way back in the days. And it's, it's a good example for, for, for countries that are starting their own EV infrastructure journey to follow. I see that we are now joined by Jamie Dunsmore from Transport Scotland. Welcome. Uh, sorry about all the, the faff you had signing in. So um, have you got anything to add, Jamie, with regards to the creation of, of Charge Play Scotland from Transport Scotland's perspective and, and what the driver for that was? Yeah, and apologies for being late, just um, the usual technical issues uh, on, a, on a morning start. So, yeah, I think it, it really... It, was important to see where we could get a coordinated approach. I'm hoping you can hear me okay, just I know. Yeah, yeah, all good. All good. This is, yeah. uh, to get a coordinated approach to how we can help encourage EV drivers across Scotland um, make the switch away from petrol and diesel onto electric vehicles. And I think Charge Play Scotland is a, or was a way of directing our efforts and making sure that we had a, a consistent and consolidated approach to how we would help develop the network and not just look at having charge points installed in areas where there was you know a, an urban settlement but also looking across the whole of Scotland particularly in our rural and rural communities and using and and the consumer experience as well so developing the network so that people knew what to expect if they traveled across Scotland so I think Charge Play Scotland was really initiated as a way of helping the early uptake of EVs and removing some of the, I suppose, the unknowns or the perceived barriers around range. And it has taken a while to get the, the number of charges on the network up, but it's been yeah, an, an interesting journey. But I think what, as I've just heard one of the other panelists said, what we've got is something that is consistent and we know what to expect as we travel right across Scotland. I think the, be, the best way, I think the best way to sort of visualize how things have changed and even just the last few years is that pretty much all the EV charge points that were in the ground uh, were all free and even sort of back in the day likes of energy saving even uh, sort of transport Scotland the, the, the terms had to be free for at least a year and that was seen as um, sort of a influencing factor to try and get you and I driving an electric vehicle and that has since changed, not just in the context of the rising electricity prices, but the fact that how can, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into this as the session goes on, but how can we attract private sector investment if we're asking them to compete and it's free? Uh, and I think that that's, that's been really interesting, even just the last year, seeing how it's gone from just a, a very small number of, sort of forward-looking hosts to, well, vast majority of hosts now at least considering uh, if not already you have a tariff in place true and actually on that note i mean one of the polls that we don't have is would you rather have free charge points or would you rather have ones that are, are paid for but i am confident that um the majority of electric vehicle drivers would actually prefer to have charging tariffs because it means that the infrastructure is actively looked after by its owners um and actually well what we'll do very quickly is we'll launch the next poll uh, which is having discussed the the kind of the the, the unification the the one app slash one f well basically one account fits all for all of Scotland's local authorities and various businesses has Charge Place Scotland resulted in better public charging infrastructure or a better public charging experience than the rest of the UK particularly if you look at the various different networks that you encounter in in England you know you need to, a Swarco account for Manchester I think it was a Franklin one for Liverpool I don't know who's taken over is it. Oh, it's something. raw, ch raw charging, I think, isn't it? That, oh, it's raw, is, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And then BP Pulse, of course, uh, if you can get them to work in Keynes. Um, you know, all these different places, it's, it, you, you do need to be um, on the ball and have the right accounts and cards and things. So I, I think we'll we'll close the poll now. Uh, we've got a, a decent kind of sample size. Um, interesting results, actually. So there is... Uh, 
um, you know, well, there's, there's very few people saying no. There's a lot saying yes, but there's fractionally more saying that they're not sure. And I well, think that the thing on that point, you and you have to ask, have how many people have actually travelled with their EV out of Scotland? And it's probably not that many, so they can't possibly be sure. Uh, I, I think the answer would probably still be yes, though, for those that have travelled outside and experienced the, the mess that exists down south. Great it answer. will get better, I mean, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's navigable, but uh, it's, it's just a bit more of a faff, isn't it? Especially if you don't already have an RFID card for them. And, uh, and if they don't take contactless credit card payment, then you need to sit and download the app and register on the app. And the app might not be the, the most user friendly and so on. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree from uh, various. Oh, hang on a minute. I've forgotten to do the thing again, haven't I? Share results. Ah, I'll, I'll learn. Sorry, stop sharing. I had already shared it. Cool. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with you that um, certainly from my experience, the fact that you can go to any local authority in Scotland and numerous businesses as well, and it's just the one account, um, certainly on paper, it makes that uh, a much easier experience. So moving on to um, exactly what is Charge Place Scotland, because people automatically assume if they're new to electric, in fact, even people who are experienced electric vehicle drivers, they assume... Charge Place Scotland is the equivalent BP Pulse of Instavolt of of Osprey. You know, the a network that owns all of the hardware that's that's in the ground as well as running it and maintaining it and and you know administering charging sessions. But it's not like that, is it? So, how is Charge Place Scotland structured then? A one for me. Yeah, go for it. Oh yeah. Uh, so Charge Place Scotland, you're absolutely right, Ewan. Charge Place Scotland owns nothing. Uh, other than intellectual property in terms of the Charge Place Scotland name and logo. Charge Place Scotland, I think you, you touched on it earlier, Charge Place Scotland offers a single unified point of access to a network of nearly 2,500 machines across the country. Uh, those machines are owned by four, either public or commercial owners. Uh, they are supplied by over 10 different manufacturers. Uh, and at the moment, they are delivering over 150,000 charging sessions a month to a membership that's now approaching 50,000 people. Uh, it also provides, uh, and this is where we come in in terms of network operator, uh, a single point of 24-7 service for any drivers out on the road who need assistance or who just have general queries about the network uh, and provides the back office functionality that ties all the data management between every single charge point together into one uh, charge place network operator system, uh, as well as all the transactional data within CPS to produce invoices and revenue for hosts overall. Uh, it is a complex organism. Uh, and I am not going to wax lyrical throughout this about any sense of its perfection because it has its issues. Me and Bob deal with them on a daily basis or try to deal with them, along with uh, speaking to stakeholders, uh, whether in the driver or owner community, but it does work. Uh, and going back to a point was made in terms of your poll, what we do find, especially from those who visit Scotland, EV drivers visit in Scotland is they are markedly impressed by the ease of access they find coming into the country and driving around. Uh, we do receive regular feedback on a weekly and monthly basis from many drivers, but we do know there is a very clear expression of delight from those who are not used to CPS, uh, which I think bodes well for the future as well. And that single unified point of access, the difference it makes. Excellent. Um, there's there's a number of polls that we have to to launch throughout uh, today's webinar, and there's one you're, you're saying about the you know obviously things aren't perfect for for any charging network, but um, for all of the you know for for every person who complains loudly about an issue that they encounter, chances are there's tens or, or maybe hundreds more who aren't encountering many experiences day to day. So what I want to do, I mean. Uh, annoyingly, this poll comes across as being negatively worded, but I'd, I'm interested to find out what the most common charging issues are that are encountered when charging in Scotland. Um, whether, I mean, by, by default, that, that 
means probably charge play scotland but there are other networks as well mm -hmm. of course however the top answer is i rarely encounter any issues so i'm interested to see um you know the the, the most sort of typical cross section of of encounters uh, of, of issues that are encountered and i think that this will probably um almost sort of pay homage to the fact that uh it is the structure of the Charge Play Scotland network, and we might see where the kind of bottlenecks are in, in resolving those issues. Uh, it is quite a, a lengthy poll. There's numerous answers, so people are taking a little bit longer because they're kind of okay. reading through everything and be like, oh, okay. okay, that one. Um, uh, Jay, Jamie, you obviously want to butt in on that. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Jamie. It was just really on the, the point that, that was being made by uh, Stephen as well, and I think it Although Charge Play Scotland don't own or operate any of the charging points and it's the, the network and it's the brand, etc. I think there's actually much more to it than that as well, because what it does give us is for, although we're not all of the chargers, public charge points in Scotland, there's a very significant proportion, but it does give us sight over how the network's performing and, and over how the network's developing as well, rather than relying on sort of external in tools and apps like ZapMap, where we can look to see how the networks will generally develop it in Scotland. But I think there's a lot, there's actually, yeah, not to do the guys at, at the back of the site, this service, there's a lot that goes in behind the scenes and a lot of valuable information and data that sits and helps us develop our approaches and how we, um, I suppose, how we come at the future development of charging in Scotland. And I think that's that's the other value of Charge Play Scotland. It's not just the network and it's the unified approach, et cetera. It's also how that, as, as we develop a more substantial network across Scotland, how we have access or the information that gives us access to and the understanding that we can develop over what the needs of people using the networks are as well, which is, the, I mean, that's at the centre of a lot of it as yeah. consumers. Yeah. I think it's important to note as well that the Charge Play Scotland don't lead on the development of sites. We don't determine where chargers go. Uh, we don't, you know, we, we don't install chargers or anything like that. What what comes onto the network is entirely decided by local authorities or private businesses, uh, people who receive funding, make applications, get grants, and so on and so forth. So. I know there's been a few questions that have come up in the chat about you know plans to upgrade chargers, what, what are CPA is going to do about sites north of Perth, 450s and things like that. We don't have any control. Um, we, we cannot dictate what goes in the ground. Um, we can operate whatever is put in the ground, but the, the various challenges for the very specific sites uh, in terms of power supply and so on and so forth are, are not something that we have a hand in. Uh, and, and can you know actively or positively uh, change in any way. Uh, so it's important for, for any driver that's using the network and anybody who's um, maybe frustrated about a perceived lack of progress, that they, they do understand that, um, that it is a, a very much a collaborative project with lots of different stakeholders and things like that involved, but ultimately charged by Scotland as an organisation, don't dictate what goes where. I suspect I know why Matt's hand is raised at that point. And also, thank you, Bob, for picking up on those comments in the chat. I've seen, yeah, I saw those very comments, and I, I thought this is something that we will be covering uh, with Matt um, and Jamie later in the, the webinar. But I'll quickly let Stephen answer. Uh, no, it was just a, a very quickly uh, addendum to the point about the Scottish infrastructure. And I think it was the latest DFT figures that came out last month show that Scotland still has one of the highest proportion of chargers per head of population in the UK and still leads the way even over London in terms of rapid chargers per head of population. Uh, and I think that's very little to do with CPS. That's, well, it's more to do with funding and people's appetite for it, but I think it's a very healthy situation for Scotland as a whole. Yeah, we're certainly lucky in comparison to Northern Ireland, which has is it sort of less than two rapid chargers per 100,000 people? Um, hence the importance of the, the faster project and any rapid chargers that the people of Northern Ireland can get. But um, I'm just going to quickly share the results uh, of the poll. Um, so yeah, 22% uh, saying that they, they rarely encounter any issues. Um, charge point out of service. This is an interesting one because, of course, as we discussed, Charge Play Scotland does not um, 
on the actual charging infrastructure. And I just want to bring up uh, part of the, the Transport Scotland slash Charge Play Scotland framework, um, which says that Charge Play Scotland will provide an active fault management system, including fault reporting and liaison with both Charge Play, uh, sorry, uh, Charge Place owners, Charge Point owners, that should be, yeah. and maintenance contractors. Um, but uh, it then later says about notifying owners and suppliers of faults as opposed to necessarily um, doing active liaising between those parties. So could someone, uh, I presume, well, Stephen or Bob, are you able to run us through yeah. the what happens when a charge, a charge point breaks? What, what's the you next know, step? There's two different scenarios. Uh, we'll take the first one, which is the CPNO monitoring the state of the network. So if a unit falls out of comms or registers an error, that will be picked up uh, on the system pretty immediately. Now, please do bear in mind, every charger on the network relies on the mobile data network to communicate back and forth. Uh, nothing is hardwired in a connection. It's all based on the mobile signal that everybody's mobile phone relies on as well. So units will drop in and out of comms, but generally they will come back in quite quickly. But when a unit does flag up as faulty, it will generate a fault ticket, which is then raised for immediate investigation. Uh, if that is unresolvable unresolv remotely or at that time, it will be raised into both the manufacturer and the owner for awareness and essentially set the clock ticking on what is a 48-hour window to either repair the unit or at least inform us back of the plans to repair the unit and the timescales. Uh, the same principle applies if a fault is reported through the web form or across the phone lines, etc. Uh, once the guys in the service centre have logged the ticket, they will then inform the host owner and supplier of the unit of the existing fault. And same principle, the expectation is for either of them to come back and explain the next steps to fix it complications around that and i think it's maybe something not particularly for this but another session is obviously every unit or every collection of units has its own warranty and maintenance agreements uh, relationship between the owner and their supplier in terms of how things will be fixed that sometimes can determine how quickly a unit gets fixed as well which is out with cps's control yeah i think from from a user perspective on that Stephen. yeah but there, there's an issue with transparency and awareness. We see a unit out of service, the only way we find out it's broken or why it's broken or what the projected timeline for repair is, I accept we can't be certain, is that we phone up and ask, which is not yeah. good for the call centre because that's calls that you could probably do without. Uh, so again, it's one of these things where you, you don't have control over how long it will take, but yeah. you possibly do have control over putting up notification User no or owner notified, uh, projected repair, uh, two weeks. Uh, updates will be posted as and when. And that, that sort of level of simple information actually will offset some of the, the issues that we saw in the poll there where units out of service. Actually, if people know the unit is out of service in advance and there's a projected repair, that just eases the consumer journey a little bit. Yeah, and that, that's, and that, that's pretty much where the app and the map development is focused on at the moment. Uh, medium to longer term is providing that level of dynamic interaction to a greater degree granularity on a daily basis, well not even on a daily basis but on an hourly basis. So when the system does recognise, because it's all also fed from the same system, that a fault ticket's there, that that then is reflected with appropriate level of detail in both the map and app. So nobody is turning up at a charge point uh, and finding a surprise. Yeah, one of the things we have done in an effort to improve that transparency is put details on the website of units that are out of service. So if you look on the Charles Place Scotland website, just underneath the map, alongside the, the tariff notifications and things, there is an out of service list that lists uh, charges that are, are down for long term um, that drivers can look at. Uh, this is a, a new initiative that the, the previous network operators did not do, um, but we're trying to improve that kind of communication with the drivers so that people know what this kind of situation is uh, on the network. Um, you know, as Stephen said, some of these other things that are in development and stuff like that as well are going to help with that process too. That is a very positive step. Is it going to be possible to include specific you know, charger specific data 
within the information page for that charge error. So uh, it shows on the map as being out of service. You click on it, it gives you the tariff information and stuff, but then explains why it's out of service, how long it'll be, rather than a separate page that's like, oh, okay, scroll, scroll, scroll. Oh, there's the one I was looking for. Is it possible to have the tailored data on yeah, this? And I think that that's ideal, just to take a recent example, uh, not to pick on person can roast, not to pick on person can roast. Uh, they had to do a lot of work around their power supplies to quite a few units recently. Uh, and we obviously we were able to list them as out of service for a defined period of time. But it would be would have been ideal to actually have manifested that information within the individual charger detail on the map and in that. And that's where we want to get to is that level of detail does start to appear versus the individual chargers or individual hubs. Excellent. Um, one of the other points that was raised on the previous poll, actually, is, um, again, not Charge Play Scotland's fault, but it's something that a lot of the Charge Point owners who are on the webinar with us today could definitely take note of. Um, numerous people have mentioned it in the chat as well, and that is hogging charging infrastructure beyond, you know, your, your car being fully charged, or in the case of a rapid charger, um, beyond getting the vast majority of your charge and then the battery getting to the point where it's only pulling a few kilowatts, you'd be just as well moving to a slower type two post and freeing up the rapid charger for someone who actually needs a rapid charge. As we get more and more EV drivers, it's becoming more of an issue. So, um, the next poll to launch is should all local authorities introduce automatic overstay penalties on rapid chargers to encourage fair use, even if they man if they plan on keeping the tariff to use it free. So free lecky, but don't take liberties. We will fine you if you stay on it beyond fully charged. Um just whilst we're waiting on the oh my goodness, it almost looks like a yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very one-sided, the answer to this one. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> local authorities, please take note. And that includes Perth and Kinross, who I believe are going to be introducing a tariff soon, but they've been free to use for a long time. And that has caused issues at uh, Broxton Park and Ride in particular, where um, there's three older uh, 50 kilowatt rapid chargers that are free to use. And you'll quite often see people actually sitting with a newspaper. They clearly go there to just load up on free lecky. Um, whilst there's a queue of people who actually have places to be, you know, if, if there was overstay penalties, if there was tariffs, then that wouldn't be a problem. Um, I think we can end that poll now. Um, it's a landslide result for yes. That's um, unsurprising. very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, tell you what, if you're from a local authority and you don't have overstay penalties on your charging infrastructure yet, tell us why in the chat. We want to hear from you. What's the you know, what's what's stopping that from, from happening? Because, as I said, you could do that even if you have no plans to implement a tariff for your charging infrastructure yet. And does anyone else have any comments on, on the topic of, of hogging and overstay within the Charge yeah. Play Scotland network? Uh, I there's been a few comments in the chat and in the questions about consistency across the owners uh, and the answer essentially is that that's it's out with the remit of CPS it's out with the remit of TS and uh, as an association we obviously want everyone to be roughly in the same place but it has to reflect their particular costs uh, I think there's one in there from Chris Payton about the overstay fee and rapids uh, looking for it to reflect the rapid charger speed I, I'm, I'm guessing, Chris, that this is particularly referring to Edinburgh uh, with their 30 minute. Our, our advice is 45 minutes to an hour with a grace period. Uh, I just noticed my video is frozen. Sorry, everyone. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour with a grace period. But ultimately, the authorities have to look at their usage profiles, who's using their devices, and try and find the middle ground. And I think that's very difficult to do. Once the infrastructure is broader, I think we will see and, and improve the uptake but yeah it has to be reasonably consistent uh, and 30 minutes Edinburgh's meant to have a, a half hour grace period that's an hour uh, there are issues I know Bob and Stephen with how that's been applied uh, and that's something you're working with Edinburgh to get to the bottom of but it works we Tesla proved it a long time ago uh, East Lothian's experience with overstay fees literally removed charger hogging overnight just 100%. to clarify, the, the, it's not a half hour grace period on the... the oh, what was it now? Uh, I think it's only 10 minutes. 10, about. 10. Yeah, is yeah. It 10? Um, okay, is that in place now? Yeah, it's been in place since, uh, since the get-go, yeah. Good, good. Um, I think I did hear someone saying that they did get a fine after 30 minutes, like bang on 30 minutes. So It's 14 seconds. 
yeah, that was it. Um, so yeah, there, there may be some issues there just to flag that up. I'm aware. Yeah, there, there, are, there are ones we're aware of that, we're, that are being looked at by the admin team and dealt with on mm. an individual basis. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. I'm aware, I'm acutely aware that whilst some of us are able to stay on beyond 12 o'clock, um, <laughs> some of you are, are not. So we better motor through the, the key points of this, this webinar because we've yet to get to the, the future. But just before we do, um, I want to talk about the handover of Charge Play Scotland because it used to be run by uh, Charge Your Car and BP Pulse. And I think it's fair to say that EV drivers were, were not happy with the uh, quality or lack thereof of, of service. A new um, contract was was drafted by Transport Scotland with various protocols, etc. And the handover took place just over a year ago, didn't it? Or, or around about a year just ago. Coming up for our birthday, Ewan. Yeah, oh, congratulations. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I understand that obviously there were uh, some issues that were encountered uh, during that migration. Um, for a start, uh, well, Jamie, are you able to comment on the migration of user data and why there was a bit of a finicky thing uh, transferring stuff across from Charge Your Car slash BP Pulse to, to Charge Play Scotland, uh, sorry, to um, Swarco to run the exact same network, Charge Play Scotland? I think it's, I suppose it's just not to underestimate the complexity of what was being done. I think it it was the largest migration ever when we moved the Church Place Scotland network across between the two back office operators. And it and it's not just about the user data, it's the number of in, infrastructure providers, the charge point suppliers, and um, the number of models and the different information that goes with that in terms of tariffs and and all the other, well, oversight charges and all the other things that are on the network. There, there was also a lot of individual data sets to be managed and to be handed over and also looking at how you integrate the, the historic operation and the, the data agreements, et cetera, that sit within that in terms of personal information with a new operator and how that's used. So it's, I think it, the genuine answer is just it's a very complicated and complex piece of work that hadn't been done before. There's challenges around making sure that you've got the right quality and level of data at the outset and making sure that that information is able to move seamlessly mm -hmm. across. And although there were, obviously there were challenges around that, I think there were measures put in place to try and mitigate the impact on the drivers and the users of the network as well, um, to, to try and ensure that we didn't leave people stranded during the, the migration if there was mm -hmm. an issue. Really. On that note, uh, a very important five second digression. So Charge Play Scotland, ideally, and I've seen so many people campaigning for this, um, in the event of loss of comms um, or you know, some sort of issue with, with communication to the, the server, then charge points should default to either free vend or cached vend. So they store your details and go, oh, yeah, you'll, we'll give you free lecky just now, but we'll bill you for it once comms are restored. Um, has this been implemented? Will it be implemented? When and how will it be implemented? When can we expect that to happen on every single piece of infrastructure connected to Charge Play Scotland? In and terms of one for, for Stephen, yeah, yeah. Every single piece, that's a difficult question. Yeah. Uh, I think it is in to, place. To, yeah. yeah. Cash Fend does work. I'm not going to claim it happens on every single machine because the sheer variety of machines and age across the network. Uh, would make that an impossible claim. But going back, let's just say a couple of weeks, we, like many people in the central belt, were subject to a problem with the mobile network. Uh, upstream connectivity providers caused us issues uh, of a morning. Uh, however, within that period, we could still see over a thousand charging sessions taking place uh, and many units delivering, even though we could not see communication with them at that time. So cash vend does happen on the network. Does it happen across the entire network? No, uh, but a lot of that down is to the actual infrastructure itself and the machines. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah. Again, I, I think an important point there is that the, it's the older machines, as Stephen says, that are the problem. Mm -hmm. So any new infrastructure that's appearing, this will work on. Back when they were originally introduced, this wasn't a consideration. So yeah. it is it is where we need to be, and it will improve going forward. I think you're right, Stephen. So yeah, there, there are a lot of machines uh, on the network just now that are approaching the end of their life. They've been in the ground for 10 years, uh, or sometimes more in some cases, and, and these are gradually being swapped out and replaced with second-generation chargers and things as time goes on. So that's always going to be a continually improving picture. 
And the other thing we work on and are actively working on at the moment is finding the best SIMs for these units. Uh, ah. SIM, SIM technology moves just as fast. So that, 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 that's a question that, that comes up regularly uh, on single network provider or roaming SIMs. Mm -hmm. And roaming SIMs are, from our point of view, the way to go, because then the, the odds on all three or four networks dropping out simultaneously is yeah. pretty thin. I think, I'll, I'll be honest, the, pa the, the past year has been an absolute education for me on how SIM cards actually work, uh, the complexities. And yes, you do have SIMs which are static and will judge their connectivity based on the traffic happening at any given time. And you have other SIMs that will find the best signal between networks to keep connection sustained. Uh, you're absolutely right, Neil. What we want is that second type. Uh, and that's we're working with suppliers and the manufacturers to actually encourage them to take those type of SIMs for their newer units, as well as actively swapping out some of the older ones. Absolutely. Um, again, acutely aware of the time, and we have the future of the network to discuss. So I'll quickly launch this poll. Um, to see what people's feedback is in the last the last year since we've switched over from Charger Car and BP Pulse, and remember there were some pretty horrendous reliability issues there. There was the the bank holiday weekend where the entire network was down for four days. People missed ferries. People had to book hotels because they were that stranded. So thank goodness those days are gone because you would never ever have got anyone from Charger Car or BP Pulse on a webinar like this. And at that point, I would like to thank everyone who's on here for actually taking part and being open and being honest. But um, yeah, bringing back PTSD of the previous days. <laughs> However, um, yeah, how has the reliability Im improved or not improved? Has it got better? Has it got worse? Have you had more issues starting or stopping charging sessions? Have you had issues with billing that you didn't have before? Actually, on that note, I have seen that some people were saying it took several months for their first bill to come through. And more worryingly, some owners, especially small businesses yeah. that had a rapid charger that was a lifeline for the area that were just being absolutely drained dry of their finances, waiting on Charles Place Scotland reimbursing them for electricity used. What's the, the story there? I think two sides to that, Ewan. Uh, I'll just be, I'll be very quick because I'm conscious uh, of time. Uh, going back to the migration, we do not shy away from the fact we had an absolutely torrid time uh, for the first four months. Uh, we, as Jamie touched on, possibly, well, no, we did underestimate the level of big data that was the management that was required to make it work. That caused significant account issues, which I think we've spoken about previously. Uh, we weren't able to associate many accounts with their RFID cards due to the data that was supplied. That leads on to billing issues, and it did take us more time than we ideally liked to get that sorted out. That then has a knock-on effect to revenue. Uh, and many wholesome owners, and I have to say this, where we uh, massively appreciated the patience they gave us at the time. To sort this out. We are constantly aware that so many of these owners operate on a commercial basis. We have reconciled much of those issues now and are still working with Transport Scotland to finalise a position for 2021 and make sure nobody is left out of pocket. Yeah. Excellent. Good to hear. Um, again, very aware of the time, especially because Matt uh, and, and Bob have to disappear shortly. Good news overall for Charge Play Scotland reliability. If it's not about the same, it's improved generally as the result. A couple of people have, have had more issues, to be fair, but on balance, things seem to be heading in the right direction. However, of course, we're heading into the future now. There have been some uh, very interesting developments from Transport Scotland and Scottish Futures Trust, who have recently announced the new funding model for uh, well, for charging infrastructure moving forward. So I understand that there's now going to be 50-50 funding. Transport Scotland provides 50% and the private sector provides the other 50%. So how can local authorities take advantage of this? Matt, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, I think just to clarify, the, the, the aspiration is for 50% of the funding um, for new infrastructure to be um, come from the private sector. Uh, I think that this is very much changing from a sort of per charge point basis of funding. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people on, on uh, the, the call today will be familiar with the local authority installation program um, of sort of previous years, where it was all based on a charge point at this location. Here's your funding, off you go and, and get it installed. This is now changing to a sort of portfolio based approach. Um, so it's a four year funding program. Um, and 
I won't go into too much detail now. I'll, um, I've asked the guys to uh, send a link to everyone for more details, which includes a FAQ. Um, but this new funding programme is all around trying to get local authorities thinking about what is it that they actually need in terms of just transition, where's the private sector not or highly unlikely um, to be installing uh, charge points? So things like uh, sort of people that just an EV but don't necessarily have a driveway, um, those that sort of park park their vehicles on street. How how can we sort of target um, these areas? Uh, areas of low income uh, as well. Again, private sector are unlikely to install charge points there without any form of subsidy. Uh, so how can we ensure that this just just trans, just transition um, is met? So th there's lots of issues. Um, there's lots of issues to consider, and I think one of the main ones is around um, local authorities and indeed the, the sort of private host on CPS uh, is their position on tariffs. And I think we we are working hard to try and change that narrative now to say that we need to move into an e special tariffs. Charge Place Scotland has to be sustainable in, in, in the long term. Um, I think it's it, it, this isn't um, sort of alien to anyone, but it, funding will run out for CPS uh, down the line, um, and it will obviously need to be commercially, uh, commercially sustainable. And I think that in order to make that happen, uh, we need to make sure that local authorities have their strategies and expansion plans in place, are engaged with the private sector, and hopefully at some point uh, towards the end of this year and into next year, we'll start to have these um, expansion plans come forward and through the engagement with the private sector, actually have some, um, EV, some EV charge points uh, of scale coming forward into, into procurement. And the other thing that we'll say is that this isn't about Charge Place Scotland. Um, the public EV charging network uh, yes, plays a significant part in that just now. But the way we see this moving and forward, moving forward, is that there'll be a, hopefully a collection of networks, a bit of diversity there as well. And to be quite honest, as long as there's interoperability there, um, ease of use for the consumer, I see Neil's laughing, <laughs> but is a is a really important point, and I think it's somewhere that we it's somewhere that we really need to get to. Um, there's um, Stuart Gregg at Transport Scotland um, usefully said, and it's stuck in my mind that. Charging your electric vehicle should be as easy as uh, flicking on the kettle. Um, and there's quite a way to go until we get there, I think. I'm sure we can all agree on, but it'd be great in, in the sort of next few years if we can work um, with all to try and get get, yeah. get to that. A couple of big points to to kind of add on to that or to you know to ask for elaboration on. So um, in terms of that investment from the private sector and multiple networks appearing, am I right in saying that this new funding, this kind of 50-50, you know, the the subsidy, if you wish, for the private sector means that this infrastructure does not need to be on the Charge Place Scotland back office as it had been previously. Uh, Jamie, you want to come in on that? Yeah, on that and and just a couple other points generally. So and I think it's all related. Although the, the fund kind of envisages at, at that level, at the level of the whole investment, the 50-50 split, it won't just be simply 50-50 for chargers that are going in or even necessarily for an area or a suite. So it'll be based on, on the need for the public funding to enable investment within an area. So we want to target the funding we've got, like Matt said, funding's limited and everyone knows it's becoming increasingly limited year on year, as it, as it seems. Um, and the idea or the aspiration of this fund is to try and make sure that we can smooth out the, the investment and the pace of expansion of charging networks across the whole of Scotland. And that's where we can make the most of the public funding. So it might be rural areas, it might be less affluent areas where the, the natural demand or the, the appetite of investors might be slightly reduced because of the number of electric vehicles, et cetera. Yeah. So I think, I think the key for the fund is to try and ensure that all of Scotland can have a charging network that works for them and that it's developed equally um, as we go over the next few years, um, which is, I suppose, the first point. And then, sorry, the follow-up, Ewan, I've distracted myself on that. So. Oh, no worries. Um, so what I'll do very quickly, actually, because one of the other points that was raised by, by Matt was um, to do with interoperability of, you know, this, this new this new future of of more networks um within scotland and of course actually that's the point there was there was talk that there was 
not going to be funding for Charge Play Scotland beyond the end of its current contracts and what the implications of, of that would be. So from an end user perspective and indeed a, a local authority slash owner of Charge Play Scotland infrastructure perspective, should the Charge Play Scotland card live on so you have one RFID ID card fits all, even if there's different back offices involved. Um, or, uh, well, basically, there's a couple of options there. You know, is it going yeah. to be a, a Wild West like in England? Or is there going to be the option to integrate uh, local authority hardware onto the likes of um, Zap Pay or Bonnet or one of these well, kind of roaming apps? Uh, Neil, I, I, think, I think it's important not to get overly caught up in that. So there are a lot of things happening in the background in Europe and globally in terms of roaming and interoperability. I, I know that Stephen, Bob, Matt, you have spoken about this in the past. So interoperability, roaming platforms is going to be way forward because technologically the cars are moving towards plug and charge. Yeah. You won't have a card. Yeah. You'll just go up to the charger with your car or hand actions are really great in video. Uh, plug it in. <laughs> the car will have a secure certificate on board it. Uh, it will negotiate with the charger. The charger will negotiate through the interoperability platform. The charger will start. You'll see the lights flash, and you'll walk away. That is what's going to happen. That's your, that, that's your switching on the kettle. No, it's even easier than switching on the kettle. <laughs> uh, with, the, with the kettle, you have to fill it with water first. Uh, here, if it's lit, it'll work. But to drive that, you need the, the charge point operators, uh, whoever they be, the, the owners or the networks, and interoperability platforms are out there. That's not a big worry. But then you need e-mobility service providers, which is where your account will be. Uh, some of you may, may already have seen things like uh, Octopus Juice, which is effectively a, a single card, single account that covers a number of networks. And it appears automatically on your utility bill, uh, which uh, I'm just looking at the results. I'm sorry, blocking my screen. Uh, it appears on the utility bill. Single network, our, our counterpart in Norway, who we've had discussions on roaming with over the years, they've generally not agreed with it because it was an expensive option. The market has now shifted. They now have an interoperability charging club for their Norwegian members. It accesses 300,000 charging points across Europe. And that number will only grow. So back to the question, the future of CPS. Yeah, I, I think... CPS still has a future as an e-mobility service provider. That would be my personal take. Uh, and I think there's real merit in that. Uh, Jamie, you've had a thought there? Yeah, no, I, I, very much the same. I think there is a future for CPS, exactly what that looks like. We're still working through. I think for us, the key is making sure that it still works for consumers as we make sort of the, the shift and the development in the network continues over the next few years. Like you said, Ewan, there's there's not a requirement for um, the the new infrastructure going on the network, the public charging network, more widely to be part of CPS. But I think what we will look for um, as proposals come through, and that's part of the work that the team at Future, uh, Scottish Futures Trust are doing just now, is look at how we can make sure that the network that exists absolutely doesn't start to deteriorate and take away from what we've developed. Um, in terms of accessibility, but also how we can make future investment more accessible or at least the same um, yeah. equivalent to GPS. And, and bear in mind that there's things like contactless as well as you know the sort of plug and play. I, I, I will, will, will forget, I know there was a question earlier on contactless and how that improved things in England. It doesn't improve things for everyone, and that's always the challenge. Uh, because you've got the, the hail payment, uh, speaking to someone who recently picked up 90 pounds in withheld payment on two failed charges, one successful one, and took two weeks to get back. That isn't a success. That, that is a failure if you take that much money out of someone's account and hold it. If you're a fleet driver, contactless is not an option. Um, getting a receipt from contactless is not impossible, but surprisingly challenging, and it's extra workload. That's not a smooth user experience. Uh, and the, the sort of extension beyond that and contactless, yes, it's people who don't do it often but if you're a regular driver the accounts will give you access to reduced charging costs i know changed there recently but there will be more services like that where you'll access reduced costs it's going to form part of the just transition where you will possibly be able to access better value charging and um, we, we, we've touched on some of that already i know that there's a lot more in such a complex area 
But I think the experience of one card to rule them all, where everyone just voted, or I suppose a large number of people voted for, I think Charge Place Scotland has a role to play there. And having interoperability with any networks that come with funding in this route, actually, that's something that we could argue is something that should be in place. So one comment that's just come up in the uh, in the chat just now, very very quickly, because the, the topic of accessibility has has kind of within the chat segued on to um, accessibility from a, a restricted mobility point of view, disabled drivers. So um, like Manager Council have tried to make EV bays as accessible as possible, but they haven't had any feedback from an EV blue bay holder. Um, Leslie, I would say get in touch with EVA Scotland, Motability and Charge Safe, who incidentally are, are trying to improve the design of, of and accessibility of, of charging infrastructure to make it safe and, and accessible. Um, just to try and answer at least one of the flurry of questions that are, are rightly coming in on this chat. But um, with regards to to contact this, uh, that's that's a good point because I understand that pay as you go is meant to be a, a requirement of of Charge Play Scotland and no doubt will be of uh, the SFT slash Transport Scotland. It, it's uh, U, U, UK reserve power. They're going to put it on every single uh, journey charger DC. Uh, there is a, a debate at the moment of whether you should have it on AC posts. Uh, Grand yeah. Chaps wants it, and same people don't. Yeah, true, true. I mean, you, you don't want a contactless card reader on a, a Type 2 cause that just doubles the price of it. However, you could have a QR code, which yeah. you can scan, which takes you to a payment terminal where you can put in your card details. And I've actually used this with the Swarco eConnect back office in Manchester, which is the same back office as Charge Place Scotland. So are there, Stephen, Bob, are there plans to introduce that payment terminal? That we, we already offer a pay-as-you-go solution on every charger across Charge Place Scotland using WebPay ah. so that non-members can use it. Uh, and this ties in as well to the question so earlier about foreign drivers that might come here and visit the right. country. Um, they can use WebPay to activate any charger. Um, they put in payment details. It's an anonymized session. They can get a receipt from the end of it if they want to. Uh, they can enter an email address and a receipt can be sent to them. Um, and they can use that to, to activate. Even if it's a free tariff charger and they don't have an RFID card or can't use the app, then they can use the WebPay functionality to uh, to get that kicked off. Um, one of the things we're looking at doing in the fullness of time as well is updating all the the point of use information at the charge points as well to standardise things across the network. So it will involve things like QR codes so the drivers can scan that QR code. It will take them straight to the WebPay link. Uh, and we're working with things like hire, hire car companies like Enterprise and so on and so forth to make sure the drivers have that information uh, at the point of use of the hire as well. So they've got that kind of detail they need to, to, to give them security across the network as they go around the, the kind of business and things. Um, but on that positive note, I'm going to have to disappear because yeah, no I've got a yep. plane to catch. So I need to go away and get that. So leaving the, the capable hands of Stephen there. Uh, and uh, I've made a note of some of those questions and things as they've been coming through. Uh, so we can respond to those if anybody's got any kind of specific queries and so on and so forth. But no doubt you'll, you'll have those uh, on record for us later on as well. And uh, we're more than happy to, to, go, to, to go back to people with some of those bits and pieces. Um, um, just to, to quickly pick up your your point there, Nori, it's, uh, it's, as you can imagine, there's an awful lot of stakeholders to be working with. There's an awful lot of stuff to fix from what we've inherited. We are doing as best as we possibly can to try and get things sorted out. Um, please bear with us. It's not going to be a quick process, but we're trying to make things as good as we possibly can. Right, we better let you dash now, Bob, but thank you again uh, for your participation today and for taking some homework with you as well. Bob <laughs> does work exceptionally hard behind the scenes, so uh, I'm off to you. Uh, enjoy the rest yeah. and relaxation, Bob. Will do. Oh, yeah, I'll well be enjoying a pint on a beach in Portugal by tonight, so. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, yeah. See you Take later. Take care. Have a good day. Cheers. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, most of you can continue to stay on. We're, we're nearly done with the, the kind of the questions I had lined up, but obviously there's plenty in the Q&A to try and run through for all of these wonderful people who are Honestly, that you should see the the interaction in the chat and everything. It's been by far the busiest uh, webinar we've had, um, and certainly Donald. If we could take a transcript of of this chat and the questions, and we can try and follow up on this, if if any of the panelists would be up for providing any information if they need to run afterwards. But um, one question is with regards to this future funding for um, Scottish charging infrastructure, the the, the so called fifty fifty funding, as I've been referring to it. I understand that's available for local authorities, and I understand that. Um, it's going to be targeted towards a just transition, as you mentioned, people without off-street parking, uh, providing type two charging, well, you know, 
um, overnight charging infrastructure basically nearby, but also providing some fast or ultra fast charging infrastructure, perhaps in more remote areas where uh, private charging networks wouldn't deem it economically feasible. However, that money is only available to local authorities, isn't it? So what happens if you've got, uh, I call it the shield shop scenario, because shield shop has a 50 kilowatt rapid charger that's an invaluable lifeline for anyone going from mainland Scotland to the Isle of Skye. I used it in my 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. Check out Plug Live Television. You'll see the road trip. But, um, you know, that was essential. I would not have been able to do the trip without it. So what happens with your humble little sort of, you know, shop or cafe owners, the small hosts on or sorry, owners on the Charge Place Scotland network, when it comes to replacing and upgrading their infrastructure, if the Instavolts, the Ospreys, the BP pulses of the world say, now nah, that site's not economically feasible, but it is without a doubt a valuable lifeline. Is there anything that Scottish Futures Trust in conjunction with Transport Scotland can do to provide them the funding they need to replace that lifeline and keep it going? I will tackle that one before very quickly running away to, to go to Edinburgh. I'm not going to Portugal, uh, unlike Bob, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. No but never mind. Um, so, yeah, uh, the EV infrastructure fund that we have is open to local authorities, and that, that will certainly help um, move things along, uh, I think, to get to where we need to be. For the Shield Shop uh, example or, uh, and any others, um, I think that what has been very clear through our engagement with some of the CPOs, and we've actually got an investor roundtable uh, next week. Um, what is coming out of that engagement is that there's a lot of land grabbing going on at the minute. Uh, Neil, I'm, I'm sure that you, you might have had sort of similar engagement. Um, a lot of these companies out there just now are, uh, are targeting areas that, that they're trying to look at land that they can grab to put their own charge points in to try and effectively secure some form of user base, almost as a bit of a loss leader, if you like, uh, in, in some cases. I think that areas like uh, Shield Shop, for example, areas on trunk roads, uh, areas that are, get very high traffic flow, particularly those that have already got a um, supply in from, from a DNO, I think they will be attractive particularly given um, Scotland's position now on trying to attract more tariffs, um, commercial tariffs onto the existing estate, um, as well as the, the sheer demand for uh, electric vehicles, not only from uh, folk like you and I, but also fleet drivers as well. I mean, we saw Osprey and um, British Gas yesterday and it's their partnership. So there's huge demand going on there. Uh, I think there will be opportunities, particularly in the next uh, few years, whilst we're working on the local authority side of things, whilst there isn't funding uh, available from Transport Scotland for this, I see James got his hand up. Um, the, I, I, do, I do think that the private sector will take a, a, a much more um, much more of an interest in sites like them, uh, even on a sort of lease model. Um, it's where the, the likes of Shield Shop can, can effectively get some income from the likes of uh, Instavo or whoever else to effectively fill their boots. But again, that's just my view. I'm not sure if uh, anyone else wants to come in. Jamie? After Jamie. Yeah, no, I would, I would maybe just add, so that although the funding's been awarded to local authorities, it's obviously to work in partnership with the private sector. And I think it, it's there's a presumption towards local authority land, but that doesn't preclude other options. And and I would also say we've not finished the detail of designing the fund. I know we've had some webinars and we've engaged with, with local authorities and others on how the fund will operate. A key part of that is developing the strategy and expansion plans that we're working with local authorities on just now. And those will look not just at what they need to provide. So they're not just going to look at what's needed to be delivered by the local authority. They'll look at what is needed for the region or the area that they're working at quite most i think local authorities work in partnership um, across a, a much wider area than just their own and and it will pick up things like for example the shield shop and other sites that may not may or may not be commercially viable because there will be key bits of infrastructure across scotland that perhaps don't sit on public land that we'll need to see it replaced i think the trick in the new fund is making sure that if there's a if there's a site or an, an area that needs to have journey charging, for example, because it's a key route, that we're able to help make sure that it's not just charging infrastructure put in now, but there's a sustainable and sort of long-term option. And that's where it may be that it's not the shop as the owner and operator of the charger 
like Matt says, it may be about the new fund and the partnerships that develop facilitating um, installation and operation of charge points by another CPO um, or, you know, or a partnership agreement. These are the things that we've got to work out, but it, it's not it's not the same model as we've had through the likes of late funding, where it's just funding to a local authority to put charges in on their land. It's much more holistic and it's looking at just yeah, the, the words, the just transition and making sure that all of Scotland gets access to chargers. And that won't be on local authority land exclusively because a lot of the local authority land that's best suited to charging has got chargers on it. And um, so I think it's just, it's important to remember that it's not, it's local authorities award, being awarded the funding, but it's not just local authority land and local authority projects that will be delivered through this. And the, the public funding is directed at filling those gaps where the private sector can't invest. Yeah, and I, I think and obviously we look to Norway quite a lot because they, they've been through most of this pain already and the far north in Norway suffers the same problem as the far north in Scotland. It's not attractive to commercial operators. Uh, in a sense, in Norway, the government have had to step in to, to co-fund chargers, pretty much what you're doing now. Uh, but it's how you make sure that the char the, or the network operators go up there and provide that infrastructure. And, and certainly in Norway, it's effectively become a licensing game. Uh, you want a license to operate on this trunk road? Well, you have to support the areas either side of it as well, those communities, to make sure that you get, and I know you've just said it, so I'm repeating just transition. And it is really important that this includes some form of clause or support to make sure that, yeah, you can cover the A9, but actually you need to get across the top to Darnesh. You need to go all the way down uh, and, and pick off the less obvious rural communities. The NC500 will bring some traffic up. I'm just picking one particular example, but it's not going to make any of those chargers commercially viable at this point. So it's making sure that, yes, they can have the funding and the support, but they have to make sure that they stretch it to support those communities. And I think that's still quite difficult. I know you're saying you're still working on it, but what are you looking at in that sort of area? It's, it's almost exactly what you said. I think when we're coming at the, the new funding models, it's very much about not just taking stock of what charges will be commercially viable and then going right with those ones. It's looking at an area as a whole. So we've got the six Pathfinder projects that Matt and the team have been working with over the last six months or so that have been looking across a range of different options um, to enable the expansion of charging networks. But a key sort of throughout that is that it's not just about individual charge points. I think Matt touched on that earlier on. It's about yeah. the area or the region and they have to take on responsibility for operating other charge points that might not be as commercially attractive if they want the ones that will make them the money. And that's where the, the funding can come in to balance that, whether it's high connection costs or just expected utilization. But um, it is, it's really about that point that it needs to be done at a regional level to make sure that the, the charge points that are put in that are maybe not commercial are not just there, but they're also maintained at the same level any faults and any repairs are subject to the same standards and that everything, regardless of where you are, you should have the same experience. So everything's kind of tied into the same central conditions, regardless of whether it's a charger in the middle of Inverness, say, or something further out towards Wilfer or even uh, the West Coast. It, and and that, that will be one of the challenges and one of the things that we'll have to work quite hard to get with charge point operators, because it has been difficult over the last few years getting some of them, the sort of more northern or the more remote charge points serviced and, and back on if, if there's been a fault. Yeah. But this, it's going to be absolutely essential that that is yeah. a place. I mean, I, again, there's, it's maybe a little outside the scope of, of the work, but there are, there are some interesting projects running along in the background in other areas, looking at how you maintain these assets. Uh, if you have a faulty unit up in the far north, you don't want to send someone up from Perth or even Inverness. You want a local operator who's able to do it uh, up to a point. I, I accept there's some skill skill issues there. Uh, is there any scope to include, sort of, if we give you this funding, your response times should be or shall be, uh, or support the local community by actually employing someone locally to do it? So it, it's a slightly different take on it. The, 
to an extent, the funding offers to local authorities would be able to contain that. The problem often with these is that there's it's more difficult than it should be to sort of implement conditions of funding. But the way that the local authorities and the public sector generally will engage with operators will be through procurement, where it is more traditional to have things like penalty clauses, et cetera, that relate directly into performance. So I think that, and that's where we need to make sure we get it right. It's in the procurement and the agreements between the public sector and the private sector to make sure we can do that. We're all we're very aware of some of the challenges around validate, uh, invalidating warranties, et cetera, where you get someone external to work on a charger. And that's that's something that is for the charge point operators to address. Again, a little bit easier when they've got a bit more skin in the game and it's potentially a bit more visible at the moment. It's, it's uh, sure Stephen and the, the team know it's kind of Charge Play Scotland. They're the front face of, of the charger. So when the charger's down, it's a Charge Play Scotland charger, not one of the network um, other network operators or the equipment supplier. So yeah, I, I think just agree. It, totally with you. It's, it's something that we need to make sure is, is sort of built in right at the core. Just to throw in some specific examples and what we were just discussing about engineer availability, lead times on repairs. Um, one of the most famous EV driving Orcadians, uh, Jonathan Porterfield, um, mentions that repair times in, in Orkney are sometimes as lead times of a month because of engineers <laughs> being fully booked. So definitely there, there should be requirements um, within the Charge Play Scotland network as it stands and any kind of funding from Transport Scotland going forwards that if you're going to install chargers in an area, you need to be able to provide that local expertise. Expertise. And there are local engineers and, and electricians um, who would be willing to assist as much as possible uh, if the suppliers were willing to liaise with them. Uh, someone has also mentioned in the questions that Isle is a key tourist destination. There's only two rapid chargers. Both of them are out of service. One is fairly new and has been waiting over five months for parts. So, well, actually, um, I don't know if... if <laughs> I'm reluctant to spend too much time on specific um, cases, but if that's something that could be expedited by uh, Charge Play Scotland, Stephen, if you were able to, to take that back, and obviously, yeah, Jamie, in terms of any emergency funding to get that repaired, because that's essential. Um, some people have been saying in, in the chat that the islands are, you know, some of them are pretty big. Uh, there's You can easily do big distances on them, um, and there's a need for more coverage, let alone less in the form of existing units being out of service. So um, I am aware that uh, obviously we're we're over time again. Thank you everyone for staying on, including um, at least half of the attendees. Uh, but we've got some excellent questions from you, and I'll try and go for the ones that are more kind of wide reaching rather than case specific as much as I really want to burrow into some of those case specific ones because I've seen them and gone yes I know that one and I'm annoyed about it too so Ron Bagnall says that uh, proliferation of smaller players installing seven kilowatt charge points all with their own app some demanding money up front do you so yeah basically you have to preload the app with a certain amount of money uh, before you can even use it um, rather than just pay as you go billing so do you agree that there are that there are menace uh, I mean you've got the likes of Hubster EV charge, charge my street. Um, need to at least force them to allow roaming, is the comment from Ron. Neil, you said you want to provide some insight on that. Yeah, I, I think in time they will be forced to provide roaming. But right now they're trying to build a business case for what they do. Uh, I can agree or disagree with it. I can see, see where they're going. Uh, but for the likes of a Connected Care, I know Heather's on the call uh, and others, they can offer time of use tariffs. They're not really targeting people who are travelling through a lot of them are targeting people who are residents and live nearby. It's a slightly different use model. Uh, so you have to take a step back and go, yes, if you want to use it, if you're visiting, yes. But for the people who live there, that will be a day in, day out usage to access and, and it actually feeds into delivering the just transition where they'll be able to access the cheap overnight tariffs that we can all enjoy at home for those of us who have home, home charging. So I think you will see roaming come in but what roaming is probably not going to offer you is the better or, or lower cost access to those units. It's going to be a little bit different. So the answer is both yes and no, but the benefits will shift. Um, actually, another one on seven kilowatt charge points that's, that's come up in the in the chat rather than the, the Q&A, um, which is important moving forward. So the future of the, the EV charging network has more and more people who don't have 
home charge points who don't have driveways are, are starting to switch to EVs. Um, rather than forcing people to go to rapid chargers, which are inevitably going to be more expensive to use because of the additional expense of the grid capacity, of the hardware, etc., um, it would be better to allow them to charge overnight near their house or even outside their house. There are a number of discrete on-street charging solutions that are available now that genuinely minimise street furniture and uh, reduce the impact or minimise the impact to people with disabilities or people who are you know, using the pavement for active travel, for walking and, and, and cycling and so on. And despite this, there are some local authorities who are quite wary, quite hesitant about uh, installation of on-street charging infrastructure, even if it's funded by the private sector. Is there anything that uh, Transport Scotland can do to help to provide a, a general consensus on the ability of um, well thought through, privately funded uh, including householder funded charge point installations um, on streets that are wide enough to cope with the likes of connected care or Trojan energy, which themselves do not take up much room. Other solutions exist. Transport Scotland, is there any way that we can break this deadlock for some of the more uh, wary uh, and, and, and kind of skittish local authorities who are currently saying no to everything, even if it doesn't require a traffic regulation order to have the, pay, you know, the, the space reserved for EV charging only? Yeah, it, it is a difficult one because depending where you are, obviously Transport Scotland is responsible um, for the trunk road network, but roads authorities for the rest of Scotland's roads are the local authorities. So it, it is at their discretion, effectively, their, their function of the legislation is the roads authority would be the one to decide what could be put in. I think that the, the diff, a different way of coming at this is it's trying to work out what the solutions are that are appropriate to each of the communities and that is maybe where it's easier rather than trying to direct you know an acceptance that this is okay to put in in a street you know a, a, a charging solution it's maybe more about working to identify what's appropriate in different scenarios and what works for people we're doing some work with the energy savings trust just now that was looking at planning ev infrastructure and the installation of that infrastructure and they've engaged with a huge range of stakeholders to develop that and that looks at solutions like on-street charging or issues like on-street charging, what some of the solutions are. Part of it is, is obviously about information and getting the understanding of what the implications and, and benefits of the different options are. And I think that's what we're trying to do with a number of case studies and the guidance. I think the guidance should be published, um, if not in the next week or by the end of this month, within the first half of July. And that should start to form more of a basis for private and private operators and the public in general to try and identify where options that would suit them exist and how they've worked in other places and that's maybe the point to, for us to start engaging with local authorities as well and um, we can also pick that up through some of the work that we're doing with them on the expansion plans but i think it it's not just for local authorities to to sort of dictate what they will accept over the whole area is quite a challenging TROs and everything else aside it's quite a challenging um, environment to navigate because there are so many different factors that influence what can and can't be put onto uh, public streets. Thank you very much I mean it definitely as soon as that guidance comes through that's accessible by local authorities a lot of local authorities will hopefully take that as as gospel and start to use it because some at the moment are saying we are awaiting guidance so that will be invaluable thank you Jamie that cannot come soon enough I've just been given uh, a heads up that such has been the uh, the level of, of in debate and engagement in today's uh, webinar that we're actually about to run out of the recording window for Zoom so don't disappear because we can stay on but what we'll do is we'll, we'll finish recording now uh, so if you're watching on YouTube thank you so much for joining us and for those of you who are still with us just now stay on for faster after chat where we answer even more of your questions <laughs> but thank you to all of our panelists um so we, we still have with us neil swanson